Hello, Andrew here. Welcome to lecture seven in the Using Creative Multimedia for Youth Engagement module. This lecture we'll be talking about um, social media use in young people and just kind of issues around safety and, you know, leading towards a, a, an informed use of that, I suppose, and just get some sort of um, background on a lot of that. So, yeah, I'll just crack on. Um, here's an image that um, kind of did the rounds of couple about a year and a half ago for a lot of uh, young people in a an art gallery in Amsterdam and it was this you know kind of the image on the left is the the, the proper image which just you know look it went around social media is just this sign of the times and a lost generation of you know young people who can't appreciate art and are so engrossed in their smartphones and new technology while they're there but it's that you know i gave birth to a couple of memes like this one on the right where um yeah just things are inverted slightly the true story was actually somewhat different where they were using an app that the art gallery had um provided to research the work and actually optimize their use of the technologies to um you know, enhanced their experience. So kind of, you know, I thought it was just an interesting thing to kind of open with, just this sort of, uh, this perception of, which is like a more impoverished version of this use of technology and young, pe young people's capacity with it, when the reality is, you know, in a lot of extents is the, is the opposite, where it's being used as a tool and, and, and as something to enhance experiences. I just want to do a rundown of like potential issues and risks around social media. Um, this is by no means conclusive. Um, it's just one that I wanted to pull together just to expand on a few few aspects of what we're going to discuss next, really. Um, and I suppose you know the one thing is they're just. I, I just want to really paint a picture of how much pressure young people are actually under when it comes to social media from very different aspects of that, you know. So one is this sort of broader public perception of, you know, lazy or ignorant young people who have no interest in art or culture. And then the other ones are just real sort of, uh, you know, potential issues or more personal ones when it comes to just the behavior and the habits associated with the technology interaction with other young people or society in general. And um, and then just other sort of, you know, um, aspects of that, which are a bit unique, it's, you know, in a different media sense, you know, in terms of just kind of uh, having to perform or, you know, to uh, to be constantly available, which is like a big issue in itself. So I'll, I'll just run down through these and, and we'll, we, we'll, um, we'll pick them off one by one. So, you know, potential issues and risks we're looking at, interpersonal um you know, risks of just interpersonal behavior and teens, teens losing the ability to learn about and read social cues um, and not being able to read nonverbal behavior properly if they're, you know, most of the time is spent in a virtual world. You know, related to that, we have like soft skills like cooperation, physical interaction, inclusivity, that could, you know, even go as far as like different forms of intimacy, not, you know, um, not, I just mean in terms of, reading people and reading different sorts of relationships i suppose uh critical thinking retrieving information deciphering facts and truth from lies because you've just this constant barrage of information so you know when do you get to kind of step back and really critically analyze what you're receiving and how how, how much of it is valid and true and you know that's just something where it's, which is a bit of a phenomenon with social media which we'll get out again a little bit later um relaxation being able to switch off and be present and mindful in your interactions or even even as far as meditation and you know things like this where you don't have the opportunity to turn off you're constantly on and constantly available and then again another uh, related area would be like just anxiety or static anxiety around that or social media is creating this sort of excessive dramas um, because positive messages are read more neutral than they're intended to be and neutral messages are read as negatives. So there's a lot of ambiguity in there and just in terms of how the language is per per portrayed and you know how you interpret that and the amount of kind of downtime before a communication is validated and all these things lead to like you know real sort of anxieties with that and likewise with you know the status element of that of how you present yourself and how you um how you articulate uh, articulate these things 
so they're all like big issues for anyone at any age actually you know so it's like for if you're looking at you know teens who are in that stage of development and having all sorts of like you know um different sorts of agendas or politics or you know things of how they relate to each other just being teenagers and this is just like a ramped up level of that again where everything is kind of retained um anxiety from the targeted ad marketing campaigns and unhealthy expectations in themselves so we, again we kind of get at that a little bit later because that's a unique one where it's quite different to how tv me, uh, media would work or advertising campaigns or you know everything's a little bit more particular and a bit more bespoke now so there's um it can lead to these sorts of unhealthy expectations really unhealthy sleeping patterns like always being available always being on and just kind of relating to people outside of like being in their company and um, deviant and risky behavior and um, that can you know go as far as as anything like sexting and um you know just you trying out new apps like say snapchat and you know things that are sort of uh look like there's no recording element to it or there's nothing being retained and this can like you know the perception that that is the case can lead to a different type of behavior and you know it likewise with just accessing or allowing other people to access your accounts and bullying cyber bullying and different things like that coming around as a result of that and just um you know just language of hate and different sort of you know taking on um things getting really ramped up when they're removed that um language can kind of you know um, become really vicious and really kind of violent and very direct online so um and that just on that last two points really the deep behavior risky behavior cyberbullying and hate one of the the other kind of interesting things about that is just how much of that is recorded and kept and stays online so you know if it's a bullying issue and something that looks kind of trivial or could be trivial if it was between two people in the same um, space as each other but as soon as it's done online it's and other people are privy to that it stays there and other people it can kind of take on different um different sort of complexions or just you know harbor grudges for longer really where outside of what would normally happen in the um in the real world if you were kind of face to face with someone so you know as i said that's not kind of comprehensive i just wanted to kind of paint a picture of how um how busy a lot of that actually is you know and um how, how much there is to kind of contend with there so the same breath then you're looking at there's a bit of a conundrum happening here you know so say we take a concept like antisocial behavior where being lost online for for hours and hours on end and like relating and interacting with people online is a form of antisocial behavior or would have normally been called that where you're actually not socializing in the obvious sense like that and likewise if you're kind of congregating outside um in gangs or different elements like that or you know you don't have any of the resources or any um you know um, amenities close by where it just looks like you're congregating that that is also a form of antisocial behavior so you know, again, I just want to build up that sort of picture of that this is the reality of a lot of young people and the kind of world that they're having to contend with, where you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, your best isn't good enough. You have the same sort of conflictions and issues as everyone else next to you, but you're kind of singular and alienated within that and can sort of articulate a lot of that stuff as well, you know, and all this kind of with additional things which we'll talk in the next lecture about like you know a disinvestment in young people and you know not having any sort of rights or the the opportunities be it educationally or employment that um or any of the securities or welfare around that sort of stuff that would have existed with with every other generation before them really well you know the last four or five generations before them so these are all kind of key issues that show a bit of a difference so Kind of as a catch-all, I want to just talk about the the impact that the social social media in particular can have, and there's not a lot um written on that. It's it's all kind of hearsay in terms of like violence and video games, or you know having to say mostly around gender or presenting yourself as sexualized with, with you know young women and the likes. But um overall, it's a case of just in terms of an umbrella to catch all of that. Um, we don't really have one. We do when it comes to um, to television, really, in terms of cult of Gerbner's cultivation theory and examines the long term effects of television. The primary proposition of cultivation theory states that the more time people spend living in the television world, 
the more likely they are to believe social reality aligns with reality portrayed on television. So um, this is kind of an interesting point. And I think it, I, the reason I did include this because I do think it extends as far as, you know, social media. As we've discussed in a lot of these other lectures, we see that a lot of the grammar from media, television and cinema media has carried over into social media, into advertising, into different ways that people would, um, into gaming different ways that people would perceive themselves or present themselves. This sort of new type of celebrity is not a million miles away from, you know, a version of celebrity that would have existed on television or still does exist on television. So there are some obvious parallels that we can, we can draw on there, you know? So what I want to do now, I just want to show two quick videos. They're different sections from Gerbner's um, film a documentary uh, around cultivation theory on the mean, mean world syndrome and just how these sort of perceptions all add up and impact again. And all I really want to do with all this is build up, paint a real picture of that sort of the pressured exist existence that young people are having to operate in. Let us start our story at the very beginning with story itself. The most distinctive characteristic of human beings as a species is that we are the storytelling animal. For the longest time in human history, stories were told face to face in the community, uh, in the tribe, uh, in the family. And for many uh, hundreds of thousands of years, that was the only thing that is possible. Of course, there was also imagery monuments like pyramids or obelisks or murals, cathedrals, they're all images and they're designed to create a sense of awe or a sense of understanding of nature or of power. This is the true magic of human life, that the stories by and through which we live are the stories that animate us, that make us seek certain things and fear other things and for a very long time, this magic was tightly controlled. It was controlled by what we now recognize as the priesthood, as some kind of a priesthood or a tribal chief. Then, at a certain point in history, it all changes. It changes when we reach the Industrial Revolution. When the printing press is combined with the steam engine to make rapid printing possible, uh, to make the spread of literacy a virtual necessity represents the industrial revolution in storytelling. Where shall I go? Where I go? Where I go? From that point on, there are corporations that mass produce stories and create a new kind of entity called the public. This is crucial to understand that it is the mass production of stories and of messages and of images disseminated to millions of people who could never be reached face to face by the same source. And by doing that, they establish a loose aggregation of people who have nothing in common except the publications they share. The second major change, a change that is still accelerating, is the electronic revolution. And the mainstream of the new electronic revolution is television. After 10 years of experiment, television, first shown to the public at the World's Fair, now takes its place as a new American art and industry. Uh, we have to recognize that television ushers in a new age. The top of a million homes, antennas pluck the pictures from the sky. At a flick of a switch or the turn of a dial, the scene reappears on the television screen. Fantastic. But our children will grow up with this miracle enriching their lives and giving them a new understanding of the whole world. Ah. For Gerbner, here's what mattered most about all of this. This amazing new storytelling force was conceived from the start as a way to sell things. By television, American business has found a most effective advertising medium, and in turn, Advertising has provided the resources that sustain the standards of programming 
and permit the never-ending research that is the heart of the television industry. The broadcast airwaves may belong to the public, but television in the U.S. was funded from the start almost entirely by advertising. It was private companies, not public tax dollars as in Great Britain and other parts of the world, that bankrolled network TV programs in the U.S. So from the beginning, the primary function of TV shows was to attract large numbers of people to see the advertisements of the businesses that paid for the programs. For the first time in human history, most of the stories, most of the time, to most of the children are told no longer by the parent, no longer by the school, no longer by the church, no longer by the community, no longer handcrafted, no longer community-based, no longer historically inspired, inherited, going from generation to generation, but essentially by a small group of global conglomerates that really have nothing to tell them but have a lot to say. Let's go! From the very beginning, people have no role other than as products who are attracted to a particular program, which in effect is the bait. And boys and girls, for the very first time, we all started to eat Wonder Bread at all our meals, breakfast, lunch. Dinner. Those audiences are the audiences who are most likely to be the consumers of a particular kind of product. America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. It's the taste good like a cigarette should. And then the advertiser, in turn, pays for producing the program. From the very beginning, the public is what is bought and sold. There's one for you, and there's one for you, Joe. It certainly was a fine first round. Well, you know, everybody's buying more and more. Now, out of this comes an inescapable and highly pervasive cultural environment now produced essentially to sell. Brought to you by Coca-Cola. For Gerbner, the commercial nature of this environment was fundamental. Say it. When you call, I want you to say I'm making a thousand dollar vow of faith. Say the word thousand dollars. Say it. Operating as businesses first, media corporations present a certain kind of world, a world built to sell, offering up a distinct brand of reality shaped by the demands of the marketplace. Everything else stems from this commercial logic, from the fundamental fact that private corporations decide what fills the public airwaves. Today, a handful of global conglomerates own and control the telling of all the stories in the world. They have global marketing formulas that are imposed on the creative people in Hollywood, and I, I'm in touch with them, and they hate it. They say, don't talk to me about censorship from Washington. I never heard about that. I get censorship every day. I'm told, put in more action, cut out complicated solutions, but apply this formula because it travels well in the global market. These are formulas that need no translation, that are essentially image-driven, that speak action in any language, and of course the leading element of that formula is violence. Okay, so just a few quick points. There's another section of that that I want to show, which will just expand on it a different way towards the that the, the the violence that was discussed there, which is kind of the most um sort of the 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 most shocking or the clearest sort of manifestation of a lot of this stuff in terms of like how culture and violent cultures and what is regarded as normalized in terms of sex and violence and their sort of relationship to each other even. Uh, how that's passed into like you know some sort of normalized culture and um, there's a few things to pick up on firstly about this sort of you know there's a direct continuation from this into online media mainstream stuff that we have this media a small number of media conglomerates controlling narratives and a lot of those like broadcasters that would have would, he would have been discussing here have even it, 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 they've all moved online as well you know there's obviously different sort of competitors to that but um it is a case of trying to control that sort of broadcast model in in the um in the internet as well has become another ta a struggle which we'll, i'll comment on that now in a while because we've another video to that end 
but just this very concept right at the center of the whole thing that the public is what is bought and sold and that being the all pervasive element of this technology if you know the advertising pays for the content and the con you know so there's an agenda there straight away and it, it, this again is something which carries where you know the, the the advertisers pay for a lot of the content or if you ask a lot of young people what they want to be when they grow up and someone in the group's going to say they want to be a youtuber and you ask them okay that's interesting how how are you going to make your money and he says well uh you know youtube will give it to me and it's like okay so then the next question is how are youtube going to get the money and they're kind of stumped then you know so there's a, like a breakdown there in terms of what they know or their awareness of how the internet works and functions which is akin to you know advertisers paying for the television rather than the other way around as you know some people would be commonly known because the the content is the content which is the feature yet it's the advertising and the kind of the eyeballs on that to use like a social media online term like for the eyeballs how many eyeballs are looking at this um is what pays for that so again there's another correlation with that directly um D directly correlates with uh with, with the uh with with social media and on and the internet in particular i'll just um play run the next video about the talking about violence and then come back and comment on a couple of other comments to add then you always have to look over your shoulder a lot of times you might feel uneasy if somebody's walking by you you feel like you're always like on guard to get a handle on what Gerbner means by the mean world syndrome, it's not enough to analyze individual TV programs or films or video games. The entire media context is what matters. How one kind of story or program blends into another to create and reinforce a distinct view and sense of the world. Getting to the heart of the mean world syndrome then requires taking a look at TV the way most of us experience it at home when we're not in classrooms thinking about these things, by simply picking up the remote and doing a little channel surfing. When we do, with every change of the channel, we're likely to see the most banal content, alternating with the most bizarre and violent and frightening, so that what would be shocking in our real lives in the media world comes to seem normal and mundane, reinforcing the sense that the world is a place of constant danger and threat. I have to do what I can to protect myself and my children. And that's a fact of life, a way of life. What cultivation analysis has done is to show how these kinds of anxieties and insecurities are caught up explicitly with media culture, uncovering a direct correlation between the amount of television one watches and the level of fear one has of being victimized. If you look at it from a cultivation point of view, you see that the image of victimization, the image of risk, the image of danger, the conception that if there is so much violence in the world, I'm, I'm at risk. Not that I'm going to go down the street to be a mugger, but on the contrary, I'm afraid to go down the street at night. I'm afraid to go into the subways. I'm afraid uh, of strangers. I try to cross the street when I see somebody that I think may be dangerous to me. These are the... the consequences of exposure to violence that are cultivated in large communities over long periods of time. The finding that if you watch a lot of TV, you're likely to be more afraid of violence than those who watch less TV, may help explain why so many people seem to think violent crime is far worse than it actually is. A widespread misperception that started to be noticed a decade ago when crime rates began to drop. Here is the reality. Violent crime per capita actually dropped slightly in the latest figures released by the Justice Department. Nationwide, murder was down 5%. But the perception continues to dominate reality, triggering a fear that is out of sync with statistics, a fear that no one and no place is safe anymore. And when you're always on guard, it's hard to let go of fear, no matter what the reality. And this classic example of the mean world syndrome continues today. In fact, since that ABC News report about falling crime rates, Justice Department figures show that violent crime has dropped an additional 43% to a remarkable 30-year low. 
Anderson, the FBI says violent crime dropped 2.5% in 2008. Now, that includes an overall 4.4% decline in murders. But, but despite the steady drop, polls have consistently shown that most Americans believe just the opposite to be true, that crime has actually been increasing. Three quarters of Americans say there is more crime in the United States than there was a year ago. Gallup's annual crime poll shows it's the highest level since the early 1990s. The poll also finds 51% of Americans say there is more crime in their local area than there was a year ago. The logical question is why? Why do fear and anxiety about violence seem to be rising even when the threat of violence is falling? Well, surveys consistently show that upwards of two-thirds of the people who believe crime to be a very serious personal problem say they get most of their news from television. This is the breakthrough of cultivation analysis, a clear correlation between the amount of media we consume and the degree of fear and anxiety we have about the world. So again, you know, just a few things to pick up on there where we see this sort of, um, it can directly extend into social media. I'll, I'll take that up now in a moment. But um, what we see is just the sort of where people are pulling their information from or what they what manifests with them as a reality is a mediated version of that. So that just points to the, the significance and the, the, the profound importance of these messages that are sent out and how they're received. So we bring that up to kind of, you know, to present day social media interactions where th there's a couple of things going on here because you know the, if it, with, it, 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 it's the same mediated message except with a multiplier effect that you've all that mass media mixed with your own sort of derived content and that of your peers your friends your family whoever you know and all these different variations of it and random elements to that all kind of coming in to the same sort of um media experience for each individual um so there's less and less room for shared experience within there you know or just kind of to even comment and critique on things that are kind of unique and in instances of that because everything's kind of going by in a um a certain sort of you know a flow of information a stream of it uh you know just it's all kind of loading up and kind of passing in timelines and you can kind of interact with whichever element of that you want and it's for you to discern and decipher but you're not kind of critically thinking about a lot of that because there's such an abundance of it so you know whatever jumps out is kind of minimized with that what happens in there is you just have even less room for this sort of comprehension where you're just constantly uh, underneath this sort of um you know a fog of messages arriving at you and then the ones that you kind of put out at the same time are getting caught up in the same sort of scenario, which can lead to different types of anxieties that come with that. And this is kind of, you know, all I really want to get at here is just the, um, you know, it's this, the inherited realities with the additional pr pressure for you to contribute or perform into that um, are all potentially leading to stress, anxiety, and lowered self-esteem within that situation because you don't, you, there's nothing being sort of, there's no mirroring or anything kind of being acknowledged or sort of given back to you apart from a like or, you know, a kind of a quaint reply in 140 characters, be it Twitter or something like that. And all this stuff of the language kind of miscommunicating or misfiring or looking like it's kind of, you know, over or understated. Um, so there's an enormous amount of ambiguity going on there on top of what we've just discussed there in terms of, you know, direct TV versions of these messages. And I just wanted to kind of point that out really, you know, at the same breath, we can just see that there's the same draw, um, which I want to get at now of like, you know, if we look at young people in that sort of situation with, so, you know, with an erosion of their own sort of, um, you know, their, 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 their life choices or what is ahead of them or the supports that they have, you know, or, you know, being able to secure employment or, um, you know, it, whatever sort of pressures there are on them to kind of, to, 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 with a narrowing and a minimizing of their, the, the, the care and welfare that a state is giving to them and the opportunities that could be provided or being ex accepted, expected to, you know, work as interns for 
uh, over long periods of time before they actually gain employment. All these elements kind of combine, and you know, the what the interesting thing for this current generation is that their their interaction with online media and online technologies has been somewhat free to date. And even that's going to be kind of, you know, there's the pressure to impinge on that now, which the next video is going to explain to us a bit more um, from foreveryone.net, which is essentially a pocketed history of the internet and it's it, the, the phenomenon of the internet and coming up to the current day where, you know, there's the same big business element trying to kind of privatize it. Yeah, the title of this section is Thanks Tim. Tim being Englishman Tim Berners Lee. If you haven't heard of him, we have neither. web has been the most transformative invention of our time. I use the web to stay connected with my family. I usually use the web to like search for information, like Google. I use it more like business because I'm like a web developer. I use the web for everything. I think I spend like half my day on it. In modern times, I don't think there's a single piece of technology that has done more to advance free expression and access to knowledge and democracy than the web. I'm a scientist, so I use the internet to read scientific papers and, and keep up with the news in my field. Our entire business is actually run through the web, so without the internet, uh, we wouldn't be able to function. It's the most important thing right now. If the web goes down, now the world stops, literally. Invented no the World Wide <laughs> no Web. Um, we invented it was web. someone uh, in the CIA. Oh shoot! I should know this. I'm a computer science student. Um, let's see. Someone in the CIA. Yeah. Steve. Yeah. Is his name Steve? No. Bill Gates. <laughs> Al Gore. Siri. I can Google it for you. <laughs> there are thousands of people who are probably more famous than Tim Berners-Lee. And yet, not one of them has had the impact of Tim Berners-Lee. It says Tim Berners-Lee. Is it Tim Berners-Lee? Tim. No. For what he's created, it's kind of a surprise that we don't know who he is. The fact that they might not have heard of Tim is thanks to Tim. Well, I'm very happy that I'm not, not, not a household name. I think that must be, uh, must be very, very horrible. The way that the web works today fits the definition of net neutrality. The web is like a highway. Anyone can circulate freely, and it doesn't matter that your car is a Ferrari, it doesn't matter that you're on a bike. There's are certain regulations just in place to keep things flowing in an efficient way. Now, think about a place where because of what you're driving, you will be forced to take a different highway that is more restricted, that has more checkpoints. That doesn't make sense because we have one road system, it's really important, you can go from anywhere to anywhere. The idea of making it dependent on what sort of car you're driving is just, just crazy. Imagine a country of 10,000 cities where you can only visit five. That's the same when you lack net neutrality. There are new fears Washington may take that wide open superhighway and turn it into a toll road. The FCC is endorsing new rules that could clear the way for a two tier system. It would allow websites to buy faster service. The rules would open the door for the first time for internet providers like Comcast and Verizon to charge tech companies to send content to consumers more quickly. So now people with money will have more access than people without money. Oh, and the whole idea behind the internet in the first place was that everybody has equal access. It's not just for rich people. Everybody has access. Offering fast lanes and such could create a world where content providers that already are big and have big wallets can write checks 
and those that are small might be told, you're not worth our trouble. If this had been in place all along, what innovations do you think uh, we um, wouldn't have now? I'm not sure Twitter ever gets started because the cable company will say, Twitter, this, how's this going to make money for us? Forget it. In developing countries, it becomes critical because it can make the difference of someone living forever in ignorance and poverty to someone accessing uh, knowledge even about their rights. Russian authorities have blocked access to over 100 websites. Raif Badawi published a website promoting free speech, sometimes critical of religion. Raif Badawi was sentenced to a total of 1,000 lashes and 10 years in prison. There are lots of threats. The web has become more powerful and more powerful. Uh, voice of the people, more powerful instrument. That power has been resented by some people. The key tool for the protesters in their fight for democracy here in Hong Kong is the use of social media. We're seeing people everywhere using Twitter, using Facebook, Instagram. But there is a fear that maybe the Hong Kong government will cut reception. Nearly 40,000 websites are inaccessible in Pakistan, including YouTube. Tens of thousands of protesters marching in Hungary. They're upset about a plan by the government to tax internet use. I think things are coming to a head. The stakes are bigger than they've ever been. The rules of net neutrality, the rule that this only works because it's a neutral medium, isn't sufficiently well instilled. The World Wide Web is celebrating this month its 25th anniversary. So, I've got a question for you. What sort of web do you want? We should think more about our constitutional right. It's our right, uh, in, the, in the sense of a human right, to be able to wander around the web. The web is our new world. We need to be able to go wherever we want. Let's crowdsource a bill of rights for the web. How about we do that? How about we decide these are, in a way, Becoming fundamental rights, the right to communicate with whom I want. What would be on your list for that Magna Carta? Team is leading the very start of a movement to protect this public good that is the open web, because it's not too late yet. Team was the one opening this gate, this portal in time. We had a small opening uh, in power structures. And that was the web. Team opened the possibility of anyone to make anything happen on the web. Now the, the clock is ticking and this small gate in time and space is closing. When it's closed, it's closed and, and, and we will have an internet that is more similar to television. You know? It is up to us and it is difficult but we are several millions. Do me a favor. Will you uh, fight for it for me? Okay, thanks. Tim believes more than anything else that good things happen in the world when people work together. That's how he made the web happen. The debate over internet regulation has led to a record 3.7 million user comments directed at the FCC. And less than 1% of those comments were in opposition to net neutrality. They took to the streets and their tens of thousands and their voices have been heard. Hungary has dropped plans to introduce a tax on internet use. In Mexico, the government's bid to tighten control over the use of internet is triggering anti-censorship protests. The backlash has been so intense that the country's ruling party is now backing down. The eyes have it. The Federal Communications Commission today voted three to two for net neutrality. As the outpouring from four million Americans has demonstrated, the internet is the ultimate vehicle for free expression. This is actually the third time the FCC has tried to pass net neutrality rules. They've been trying this for the 12 years. In the last couple of times they tried it, they've done it in a way that wasn't legally sustainable. We will keep emailing, we will keep writing, we will keep fighting for nothing short of real net neutrality so that it's protected forever. The openness of the internet allowed me to produce, to build the web. The openness of the web has allowed people to build all kinds of things. We have to make sure that that kind of uh, innovation is preserved because I'm pretty sure there's another Tim Berners-Lee out there somewhere with some really cool idea.
And there's certainly hundreds of people with slightly less cool ideas. Uh, um, and we want to have the benefit of those ideas. Okay. So, you know, again, just to, we can see that there's that same sort of, there's a really obvious lobby and, you know, private sort of corporate element trying to hijack all that good work from an initial invention point of view. Once the phenomenon of it has worn off, it's, you know, and there's this sort of trying to contract it a bit or monetize it essentially. Um, what's potentially being lost there is that free expression, access to knowledge and technology, and essentially a denial of human rights. Um, and even that little short section there where we look at if Twitter didn't get off the ground because it didn't look like it was like financially viable, what would have happened next, you know? So the, the reason I wanted to include this here was just to kind of talk about it in terms of um, with young people in particular, you know, and what sort of um, access they have and the the freedom, what has been enshrined as like a, a freedom, a civic and a human right almost, you know, it's a digital, it's a human right access to, um, to the internet. Um, and how much of that is, um, you know, potentially being subsumed by these same sorts of um, media companies who did the same to uh, to do to, to turn it into a version of what television actually is, you know. And I suppose all we can really do there is point out all those sort of massive tangents that we're talking about on our, you know, the multiples that happens when we talk about social media or the web in general. Whereas television's a bit more linear where you have, you know, you have X number of channels that you can kind of scroll through, but they're all working in one linear direction. So this is essentially even more catastrophic than that, where you think of the amount of multiples and avenues being closed off, or very simply just people being denied information um, that they're entitled to, and all that having sort of, you know, another element. So I'll include that full documentary there because it's really, even to show young people, it's a really um, inspirational one where there's a whole sort of, you know, a profile. I, 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 there's a real obvious edit in the version I just showed there, but there's a whole section on just Tim Berners-Lee um, growing up and just how his mind formed to thinking about the web, which is really inspirational, especially for young people, you know, so I'll include that in the, um, in the lecture notes. I just want to have one put one other note there towards this sort of uh, sense of anxiety that comes across and I want to link it back to something we would have discussed earlier in terms of in a previous lecture in moral panics uh, I'll just read the quote and then have, I'll, I'll, I'll say the point a few comments after that the behavior and morality of young people has prompted regular unease here the media have often in, been instrumental in orchestrating anxiety through negative stereotyping of youth, the media have constructed a succession of fearful images that have functioned as a symbolic embodiment of wider controversies. The media presenting youth crime, violence, and sexual license as woeful indicators of broader patterns of social decline. So, you know, it, it, the reason I want to kind of include that again here is just to kind of do, do that further update to what is considered a moral panic where if we talk about risky behavior or, you know, deviant behavior, things that are, you know, challenge social norms, um, challenge what's socially acceptable, but at the same breath, you know, that deviant behavior being marked out and singled out as a form of social control. So all these things are kind of, you know, presenting young people potentially with a lot of crisis um, as a result of how they want to use these technologies to communicate with each other. And how much of that is in the public domain or how much of that is shared. Um, and everything just got, has higher stakes than it's ever had before is all I really want to kind of point out with that. That if it's a case of, you know, young, young, um, young, young women or girls in particular ha are being mediated a certain image of how to kind of present themselves and, you know, to, for the, to be body conscious and to be over sexualized from a younger age. And to kind of, you know, get on Instagram or follow some of these like older celebrities who, who, who do the same thing where they kind of, you know, pose or whatever else like this. So for them to be kind of mimicking or replicating their, their, their peers and yet just kind of coming a cropper where, you know, that falls into the wrong hands and becomes a really sort of a, a, something really brutal and damaging or almost like fatal for a lot of, a lot of people where there's a lot of, um, you know, the stakes are a lot higher there and the, the kickback from any sort of a fallout from that sort of those images being used for like to the end of bullying or hate or harassment 
or um, bribery or whatever else like that can have a disastrous effect on a, a young person's um, you know a young person's mental health when it comes to these things. So th this anxiety is a different sort of scenario that we're looking at here, where it's kind of astonishing how any young people are functioning at the moment in this sort of current situation. You know, we'll talk a little bit in a while. Um, it's more for you know to be understood by youth workers in particular and to kind of advocate by it for that. Because, you know, in a parenting sense, that becomes very personalized and very singular, whereas care for your own sort of children, per se. But as a youth worker, it's a case of being that middle ground to talk about it outside of a formal school environment where young people can express their fears or share their worries around these sorts of things, you know. Um, we'll talk to, about the I've, 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 a slide on safety and just recommended tools for you know assisting young people to be safe and conscious of boundaries when they're online or when they are publishing or sharing information and uh, i'll get at that in a minute after one um one last sort of video piece about the surveillance economy again another it's actually a tool that i'm going to share because it's a really really uh, well put together tool A man in a lifetime. The lifetime of all mankind is but a brief moment in the long history of this earth of ours. And only yesterday in the history of mankind has man made any significant advance in his control over his earthly environment. Computers, machines for logic may change this more than any other of man's inventions. L'ordinateur est comme toute invention a de bons aspects et de mauvais aspects. Les bons aspects peut-être peut euh, allonger notre vie dans une meilleure façon, c'est bien possible. D'autre part, il y a des dangers naturellement. Par exemple, l'invasion de la euh, vie privée par les ordinateurs. These machines, which have been with us less than a millionth of a second in terms of the temporal span of man's history, have already given promise of deep and far-reaching change in our way of life and way of thinking. À ce mélange d'informatique et de télécommunication, la révolution de l'ordinateur va s'étendre. La monnaie électronique, la poste électronique, un renforcement de l'automatisation dans la banque, le commerce, les assurances, l'administration, les services sociaux. Well, the global village has arrived, and its main street is called the Internet. It's as if there's a million computers on the Internet inside your own personal computer. People, ordinary people are becoming electronic publishers. They're putting up the things that mean something to them, and they want to share it with the rest of the world. I'm a geek. I grew up in, in the early days of tech culture, and we were all hopeful. It was a very utopian time. We imagined that the world would be so much better off. What's the big deal about internet? Anyone can put any service on and have it do anything they want with it. And it's kind of user control, right? It's, it's completely molded by the people. We imagined that if we just connected the globe to information and ideas and to each other, you know, we would, we would create a powerful society. That's not how this played out. Edward Snowden crashed the internet party. He showed us that all this networking and connecting we've been doing had created a machine for spying on us. The same systems used for commercial surveillance are being used by the NSA. Some of the same techniques used for browser fingerprinting to sort of figure out you are this unique user looking at this content in this moment of time, we now have evidence through the Snowden documents are also being leveraged by the NSA. We've seen this danger now for nearly a century. So how do we create the future we want? When you want to think about the future of technology, really what you have to do is look closely at the present. The present is the moment at which the past is becoming the future. And so anything we can know about the future, we know by looking at the present. Thank <laughs> you. 
Smartphones are modern miracles, but how comfortable are you with your identity being wrapped up in a device that's constantly broadcasting? The unique number of your cell phone is generally tied into the unique number of your SIM card, which is generally tied into the, your social security number or your passport or your license or something, right? So uh, these have to be unique on the planet because that's how your cell phone can run, you work anywhere on the planet. So when I go to India and I get off the plane and my phone works, that's because the Indian telephone company can say, oh, we see this number, okay, and we see this SIM card, okay, that looks like someone from the U.S. Let's go through the U.S. network, okay, this is this carrier, and they route through the instantly, matter of milliseconds, route through the internet back to my T-Mobile operator and say, hey, is this person authorized to charge you from India? Sure, no problem. Okay, this is their ID? Yep, yeah, okay. In the past, people have fervently fervently uh, organized against governments giving us unique IDs. I think, I guess we've all given up on that now. Um, but it's almost interesting that the, the social security number is almost less important than some of these mobile identifiers when it comes to the way we use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so it goes on a little bit there, but it, I, I'll upload the whole thing. And sorry for the poor sound quality there. I've had to kind of record it while I was playing it, as it's like a, it's not a video, it's an app itself. Um, I'd wholeheartedly recommend it. Try it out, and then it, it's a potential tool to use with a group of young people, addressing and just really putting some knowledge around privacy issues, um, and just data and info and how it's retained like it's quite playful with that and almost shocking to some degrees of just how cookies can operate and what you you know it's like a, it's it's designed to do that so you don't need to be afraid of whatever information you're giving it because it's all very in public domain or easily accessed the issue here is how it's being used and to what ends is potentially being used so just to kind of roll back over those last few slides there i just want to talk about that sort of um the specter of this sort of ubiquity of, you know, this uh, heavy sort of set of big business and commercialization and bespoke advertising and to the tunes of surveillance all coming right the way through these technologies of things that were set up as free and inclusive. And we have a whole younger generation who are used to using them as such. And this being one of their only sort of releases, sadly, in like, you know, a, a real a state of flux. But at the same breath, it looks like there's an awful lot of... Um, things up for grabs or you know things that are kind of in flux at the moment around that as well so it's a kind of it's an interesting time as well where we have enough uh history under i suppose to see how it's built but the the, op the operative thing for for me as a youth worker speaking to other youth workers is to be putting this information and the knowledge and the power that comes with that in the hands of young people because it's essential that they're aware of these of these um of these elements which really really impact on them so the last slide i want to have here is just a quick uh, we'll be talking about this in more detail excuse me in a later lecture where it's the new eu directive in terms of just recommendations around um digital youth work and uh, different sort of criteria along that so we'll just talk about the safety here because it's it's pretty well um kind of covered of what we'd want to do so uh, encourage young people to make informed decisions about how they want to portray themselves and engage online, who they want to share their content with and how to control this by using privacy settings. So that has to be just kind of engendered into how they use it. It's not like a mindless consumerist thing. They really need to look and think about these things. 
help young people to understand terms and conditions of digital service, services and ownership of their data. You know, there's a whole uh, other piece on empowerment that goes on there and just really kind of understanding, um, you know, that this is an extension of their, their civil rights, essentially, and, you know, their, their legal entitlement to this. So it's a quite of an interesting thing to, an interesting way to look at things that they're so familiar with in a different way. Help young people deal with problems they have encountered in digital settings. For example, cyberbullying, grooming, sexting, and exposure to content they find upsetting or shocking. To be able to refer young people to on to appropriate support services in, if necessary. Like that's really a vital part there, you know, is in um as I said, everyone there's no commonalities. There's very few commonalities between everyone's experience of this media because it's into multiples. So, you know, what one person might find appropriate or content that, you know, they're upset or shocked by, they might necessarily have the the wherewithal or the avenue to kind of speak about that or to raise it as something which they're conflicted by because it's just in a certain sort of flow of what they are already sort of witnessing, experiencing and interacting with. So that's kind of a vital thing, you know. Establish appropriate boundaries in their online relationships with others and likewise from youth workers with young people as well, which is a big key part of that whole document to just be able to kind of build this sort of healthy boundary. There's any number of toolkits that to these ends, but um, they're all kind of pretty much vital when it comes to um, young people really getting a handle on this and their rights and, you know, things that are kind of coming down the line, which could restrict their sort of those rights as well for everyone, not just for young people. But I do feel that they have, they have more to lose essentially with that, you know. Okay, so we'll pick up on some of those um, issues in the next lecture on the internet and social activism. Any questions in between, please feel free to send me an email and uh, talk to you in the next lecture. Okay, bye.